All right, guys, welcome to Ask Woodfit, episode nine. Um, the last episode got a fair bit of heat, heat from uh, some feminists and, um, yeah, look, I'll be honest with you, what I say about women, I say the same thing about men, so don't get your undies in a knot, don't get so angry, maybe I got that response for a reason. What is it really, give me that fisher, you know that really, are real people in? I, I don't know, I never understood about how everyone takes my, uh, my opinions, which is just subjective so seriously, like when I started this, I knew I was onto a winner when I say an opinion and people don't like it. It's, it's like an opinion, so it's fine. You can have your opinion, you can say if I'm right or wrong, but at the end of the day, this is my show. Am I right, Alex? Correct. My show. Woodford. We've got a new, new camera, so if you can see all my blemishes on my beautiful face right here, we have a Sony. What's it called? A7S2. A7S2, worth a lot of money, so you guys enjoy this quality. Alex loves this camera. He's obsessed with it. Brings around everywhere. I think I've never seen a guy so happy with a piece of equipment. I couldn't care less as a camera. But Alex reckons this is the way to go. So we went this way. Um, we were lucky enough to go to um, two real good places, Alex. Um, Sydney. David Barker Performance, the first off. Shout out to David Barker and the guys doing some fantastic things in Sydney. Guys around the area, check them out. And then also went to Camperdown on Sunday and ran our Strength Power Speed Workshop with the great man, Shannon, who's still got to get on the show. Um, which was fantastic. Alex, how did you find it? Did a bit of coaching? It was it was great, man. It was really great. Like, they took a lot out of it and just continued to learn. Yep. I mean, for you, it must be an overwhelming experience because you're only first year uni. It must be great to see all this not happening. No. Not overwhelming, Not I didn't mean overwhelming, but like a fantastic experience to, to see all this. Definitely. And yes. not many guys... I was told you, it's hard to fight, especially in Australia, mentors and stuff like that. But... You kind of did the right thing. You worked hard. That's living proof. The old Gary V. I've been <laughs> reading about Gary. Someone called me the Gary V. Can I read out this comment? What someone called me? This is great, guys. This is probably one of the best dudes. You know what I did? I, I I sent it to all my mates. We all loved it. This is the best comment I've ever read. I'm gonna give this. Can we tag this guy? Oh, we can't because I won't have him. But if we could tag him, I would tag this dude in it. This is a classic comment that I think I've. I literally have shown everyone. Here we are. Adam. Milo's okay. Someone knows Adam Milo Savjelogvic. Can you read that? <laughs> Butchered his name. I'm not gonna try that. It's a, come on. Uh, if anyone can read that, can someone please tag this guy? So make sure someone tag this guy, right? Milo Miz. Oh, oh fuck. Sorry, it's, right, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Yeah, I'm just showing them so they yeah, know. No, so there we go. They saw it. You're like the Gary V of the Australian fitness industry. It gets better. The first couple of times I watch your vids, I'm like, nah, I can't handle this cocksucker. But just like Gary, you've got a lot to give and actually give a fuck. Videos like this are important, bruz. It's an uphill battle against the bullshit in the industry. More of this, please, and thanks. The reason why I bring that up is because a lot of people who don't even know me want to criticize me for what I'm doing, who don't even know me yet. They're happy to write off what I've done in this industry in terms of... Um, the platform I've given people to talk about athletic development. Now, I'm not saying I'm the first to ever do athletic development in Australia. That's bullshit. That's a lie. I'm not. Because there's a lot of guys out there doing fantastic things before me, right? But what I am saying is I'm the first one to really push the heavily marketed side of SC in terms of push out on social media SNC without it being closed off. In Australia, it was like this big secret thing. I've got, I've got secretive methods, but we all know it's not. And I'm pushing all this information out and I'm educating as many people as possible. And I always find it funny, these guys can pot shot me and have a shot yet I'm the reason why it gave the fucking platform to do your job. So I always find that funny, but a lot of guys come around and start to realize what I'm trying to do. And if I say something negative, there's a reason why I say it. If I call something out, there's a reason why I do everything. I'm always predetermined and pre-planned. So always remember that. But I appreciate comments like that because guys like that who first think I'm a cocksucker now actually like me, which I laugh a little bit about as well. But if you actually ask my mates, I am a big dickhead if you ask most of my mates, but I care and I really love what I do. And I've always come across as that, and that's all I care about with my vision. And Alex, I've talked to you this about before. I don't care if I have to go to every gym in Australia to upskill personal trainers, aspiring performance coaches, exercise science graduates, students, whatever. Whatever I fucking have to do, I'm willing to do it. So ask yourself this question. If you can do a better fucking job than what I've done in raising the standard of SNC Australia, do it. But if not, shut the fuck up. Just shut up and stop fucking whinging about fucking me. Because focus on yourself. And I always find that funny about life, and uh, I've been watching Gary Vee lately ever since you told me to. And the reason why I bring this up also is because we're in the plane, and Alex and, Se uh, Alex and uh, Sandor were talking about, check this Gary Vee guy out, you'd love him. 
how funny the world works, Alex, when we yeah. were talking about it, and then that guy wrote the on my the, Gar- the day after. It's crazy how the world works. So it talked about visualization. And Gary Vee talks about, and we were talking about this before, how repetition, repetition. You know, talking about things people don't want to talk about. You know, hard work, consistency. And Gary Vee was talking about, I watched one of his things, and he said, you just don't want to hear the answer that I'm going to give you. It's through fucking hard work. It's not through luck. You know, and it, it, he talks about just laying the foundation, hard, hard work. And that's on any career. You can use it. So if you think you can do a better job, put your balls on the line. Put yourself out there like I do. If not, that's fine. We'll see, we'll see at the end of the careers where we all go. But that's what I'm saying. Just please come along with this journey and help me develop this industry like we all have. I told all the guys at Sydney, we're all in this together. Let's keep raising the standard. Now, I've carried on enough. There's my two cents worth. Thank you, Gary V. If you watch this, let's tag Gary V. Gary V, put me on your show, Gary V. I'm driven, I'm passionate. Get me on your show. Gary V, this is a shout out to you. If we can, if you know Gary V, I'm sure no one knows Gary V. I hope they do. If you know Gary V, I want to go on his fucking show. What do I have to do? Gary, I'm a passionate guy. I'm driven. I have a vision for this industry. Help me out, brother. You've got a massive following. Let me on your show. Let's talk shop. If we can, if we can do something, let's work something out. You can always dream, can't you? Joe yeah. Rogan as well, I've dreamed about that. I've dreamed about transcending this industry away from just people who know about it to every, in every living room in Australia. Everyone knows what the strength and conditioning coach is in Australia. That's my goal. That's my goal. By the time I'm 40, I want to hit that, and I reckon I can. 10 years. Hit me with the first question. Only two questions today, guys. Two questions. Only two. That's all I can deal with today. Two, it's a Friday. I want to go home. No, actually, no. It's light. Gary V. Gary V. This guy's a cocksucker. <laughs> Let's goal that dude. What a legend. What an absolute legend. I'm just gonna call him. What was it again? What was his name? Shit. Let's go. Let's go. So a lot of people have been asking about um, programming. You know, you ask people like, uh, do you want to do an episode on programming? A lot of people ask about it. Yep. Um, so I'm gonna give you two questions that talk about it. <coughs> so firstly- Can we call this the programming ex- episode? We can. Love the passion knowledge you're putting into the industry. Really great info. Thank you. What's his name? Just swap. Thomas. I always do this. What's his name? Thomas Condon. Thomas Condon. Thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. I appreciate the kind words. What do you believe works best for a client slash athlete's development with programming in short term? You program every eight weeks or long term programming? And Come on, Alex, you got one job and you're fucking the job up. You had one job. Mate, this is fucked. You better not cut this part out. You better not cut this part out. And I wanted to ask Stuart Goddard, Come. what does an ideal week look like in your eyes? Train two nights with a, with a uh, rest day out or how would you guys map it out? Can't we just like go one question at a time? Why did you have to throw two at me? All right, go one question. Then. Thank you because I'm a, a simplistic man and I just want well, one. I'm gonna give you back to the first one. Give then. me back to the first one. What do you believe works best for a client athlete development with programming in short term? You program every eight weeks or long term programming? Oh, well, let's think about it this way, right? Let's say you get a novice, right? And when I say a novice, I keep talking about a novice, intermediate, advanced. I'll be honest with you, 98% of individuals who come see you will classify, and a lot of them, you'll classify as a novice. Like a lot, a lot of them, 98% was a stupid number, but a lot of athletes you classify as a novice. And let's, let's even say for general trainers, right? You're gonna classify most as novice because I classify them as my novice because they haven't been through my program yet. But if they have some sort of training experience, I might say, well, this guy will progress on quicker. So I talked about this was in the Sydney workshop. And we talked about, Shandor was saying to me, look, I was in an NRL program for five years. Shandor was in a program for five years. Now you think you classify Shandor as a highly trained individual, but I brought him back down to progression one, body weight squat with band bottom up. And I said to him at the start, well, that's fine, but you haven't been in my system. So I've got to see if you can hinge. My big six, hinging, squatting, horizontal push, horizontal pull, vertical push, vertical pull, my big six. Everyone knows about my big six. Look out for the ebook very soon. Bit of a plug there. Um, but, if you look at Shandor, I started him as, hey, can we just tag him in this as well? Yeah. I don't know, we'll just tag him in this. Um, when we started with Shandor, we started him as at like the bottom level of body weight squat, bottom up with band. And um, it was always interesting when I first said to him, I said, you gotta leave your fucking ego, I don't give a fuck you've been in an NRL program for five years. That's fine, because you'll show me, you should be competent then. If you've been in an NRL program, you think you'd be competent, right? I'm not saying you wasn't, I'm just saying you should be competent. And um, we've been in pro sport, everyone think pro sport competent, but it's not always the case because it comes down to the individual a lot of the time as well. And um, 
we, I said to him straight away, listen, you're gonna start my first progression. I'm classifying you as a novice in my program, but in terms of, no, he wouldn't be a novice, but I'm classifying him a, no, a novice in my program. So how quickly you adapt and you progress is based on how competent you are at those movements. So what I mean by that is you could have trained for fucking 10 years and trained improperly and still be classified as a novice to me because you haven't hit the patterns that I wanna see. Now, there might be a guy who comes to a program like Chris Vu. Another example for you. Chris Vu, my sprinter, pro sprinter, shout out to Chris Vu. If he had Facebook, I'd tell him we don't. Um, Chris Vu is a pro sprinter, came me, could hinge, could squat, hip thrust, split squat, horizontal push, horizontal pull, everything. Hit my big six perfectly. I'm like, well, fuck. I'd classify him, for me, was, I'd say advanced. Could squat, throw, oh, something ridiculous, like stupid. Too, the numbers were too big because he was training like a power lifter. At a certain point, improving your strength numbers by five kilo isn't gonna prove your sprinting performance, okay? Because your window of improvement is only so big after that. You need to start to work on other things, your power, your speed, your technique, whatever, blah, 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 I could go on for years. But I classify him as someone who's advanced because he's hit my big six patterns. He also could Olympic lift, jump sprints, everything. Unbelievable. So the stuff that I had to do with him was completely different to what Shandor had to do or my novice guys had to do. So I think the biggest thing with the question which they're looking at is, probably when I start my novices on, you wouldn't have to really change much. Like you really, at the start, programming is very simplistic at the start because the window of improvement is quite large. You literally could do anything and they're gonna improve their strength, their power, their speed, their agility, their work capacity. Because when I say a novice, everyone's got a genetic ceiling of how far they get, um, their strength gains can go. Perfect example is genetics play a big role. We understand that genetics dictate your muscle fiber composition, your slow twitch versus your fast twitch composition. We know for a fact, um, when you're younger, we've got those interchangeable fibers that can, um, depending on how you train, uh, train will dictate what they, uh, which, what they um, adapt and turn into. Okay, so you've got interchangeable fibers between slow twitch and fast twitch, depending how you train will dictate how they adapt. So you gotta realize when you're younger, because you haven't really placed any stimulus on your body, your window of improvement is quite large. Now obviously I understand genetics play a massive role. You wanna know the perfect example of genetics playing a massive role? I want you to have a look at the 100 meter final of the Olympics. How many white Caucasians are there? Drop the mic, that's my, that's my thing with everything with genetics. Am I saying not train hard? No, that's bullshit, you're just putting words in my mouth, that's a fucking lie. What I am saying is genetics dictate how far physically you can go and, and a lot of the sports like sprinting are, uh, are dictated by genetics. That's how it is, until actually, you say Bolt kind of changed as well because in the 100, he's real tall and lanky where before was short and shocky, so he's short and stocky, so he kind of changed that whole perception of body type for the 100 meter sprint. But generally the rule is genetics play a massive big part and they dictate your genetic ceiling on your strength. When you first start training, your window of adaptation is quite large, like real big. So really anything you can do in the gym, like pretty much look at a weight, I don't mean by that, but you get my hint, will get you bigger, stronger and faster because your window of adaptation is quite large. Now, as you train, your training age increases, your window of improvement only becomes this big. Do you see what I'm saying? So you can start at the start of your training, you can start real general, real basic, general strength, and literally you can improve your sports performance or any performance, but as your strength improves and your window of adaptation decreases, training, higher training interventions need to be used to improve adaptation and training needs to be specific to get transferred to the athletic environment for athletic performance. So if you look at the question which he's talking about, what I would do with my novices, the first guys in my program is, you don't need to change any program the first fucking eight weeks. Literally, probably the first three months you don't have to do much other than literally Technique, nail them the fuck on technique. Technique, technique, technique. Teach them about body awareness, body control, movement, ability, a feet position, hand position. I talked about this in the Sydney workshop. Understanding how to coach, how to progress, how to regress the big six. How many times do you hear people talking about fucking a squat movement? Think about feet position, hand position, where you're supposed to feel it, the negative, the positive. How many people talk about the negative? You, I could go on, but no one talks about this in this industry. It's like there's no coaching element. There's no coaching about, do we coach a hip break? And it, like, I could go on for years. You know how passionate I am about this shit. But I talk about the people at the workshop. I was talking about the fit position, air position. And I know a lot of people got a lot out of that Sydney workshop because of the feedback we got. And I fucking loved it because I'm educating people on shit that fucking works. It's proven to work. And no one ever talks about this stuff. It's like just do an exercise. But an exercise, like anything, is a motor skill. Okay, you have to learn the skill. There's a skill to the expression of strength. You've got to learn how to move more effectively to execute the movement. So you've got to think the nervous system has to, um, has to activate and deactivate motor into a specific pattern, specific muscle and motor pattern, timing coordination. You have to learn how to do it up here in the nervous system, the M1, which is in, stored in your frontal lobe. 
and you get a motor spawn, I'm going to go a bit nearer on you. Uh, uh, EC coupling a motor spawn at the front lobe down the Kutako spawn on track, and we get uh, um, a movement, which is unbelievable how the, how the body moves like that. It's fucking fascinating. I'm obsessed with it, but I just watch movement and fluidity. It's fucking beautiful to watch, and that's how you learn it. You learn it from teaching the skill of, the, of squatting, and people always go to me, why the fuck do you do that sort of skill? Just like, you know, fucking just do it. No, it's you need a coach. You need to break down. It's a fucking skill like anything. Break down the skill into parts. Bring it to go hold together as a whole practice. Nervous system learns. You become more efficient. You improve athletic performance. You minimize chance injury. Time and coordination. Bang! How beautiful is that? But a lot of people don't want to fucking hear that because they fucking Woodford doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about. That's what they want to say. That's what everyone wants to fucking say because people don't like someone coming out saying shit like that and they're not used to fucking other than just squat heavy. But I've come in this industry and said, fuck no, it's not all about the weights. Technique first, speed second, weight uh, technique first. Technique first. I hope you do those things, yeah? Technique first. Um, technique first, speed second, load last. Always remember in that order. So we're talking about this guy right here. You don't need to do much for the first probably eight to 12 weeks. Keep the program simple, work on comsies. But once again, it's an open-ended question because some guy could progress a lot quicker. You might have to change the program quicker. But for me, the first 12 weeks, um, we know the first four, well, the first four to six weeks of a novice undertaking a strict training program, we know gains are neural in nature. We know that for a fact. Okay, that's called neurological adaptation. But saying that though, everyone's different, but generally rule of thumb is four to six weeks. I would say first eight to 12 weeks, you don't really have to do much, just fucking change. Just keep increasing the, the, the technique, the speed and the weight. First eight to 12 weeks. So, continuation from that, Whoa. another question from Yusuf King. This will be it though. YouTube, how do you go, okay, you said, how do you go about programming athletes? But he talks about frequency, intensity, duration, rest periods. How do you go about, um, yeah. So the athletes aren't burned out, but are conditioned to a high level, and there's cycles, periods of maintenance, it's all those little. Yeah, but I think I think the thing about that is very open in the question. Like, is the athlete in season? Is he off season? Is he pre season? So there's a number of variables to this question. So I was talking about programming before, and I think that's one thing that a lot of people want to hear about because a lot of people make it more complicated, like linear versus non-linear, like in terms of how am I supposed to periodization? Because periodize, I think periodization. I like to keep things simple. And people talk about periodization being like this mythical thing. It's like, if you understand the basics behind fundamental sports science principles, how to apply them and how to coach and program, trust me, you're gonna be fine. It's it's way too advanced. Like it's too, the people make it too complex. I can be very simple with how I do things. And simple, 99% of the time works. Basics, fundamentals, they work. It's been proven the test of time. Um, and um, if we look at a gen week, let's, let's just give an example for it. Let's just give this guy an example. My boys are in season right now. So we're talking about my boys, my soccer boys, my football boys, my rugby boys. They're the three big sports, basketball as well. In season. Now in season, so you've got certain phases in terms of periodization. You've got general prep, specific prep, competitive and transitional. Competitive is in season, competition, competitive competition, right? So in season, the main focus is training, games and recovery. Okay, everything else is secondary because that's why we do our job is to prep them for competition, for performance. That's why the fuck we do it. Um, so the main goal in season is exactly what I just said there. If you if you can't keep them on the fucking park playing their sport, or if they're in the gym too long, there's no fucking point. A lot of people get caught up on this and they, uh, they keep them in the gym too long and it's kind of breaking up their recovery time. So it's kind of just in season's about maintenance. We call it maintenance. But saying that though, there's some athletes who can improve in season their strength, their power. So that's what you want. You kind of do want to push a little bit um, but depends on, once again, open-ended question, depends on the athlete, what they can handle. Some of my older guys I nurse through and they play good football the whole uh, whole year. Other guys I push up, I can up their load a little bit. It's a very open-ended question. But this is where the art, Alex, being the coach, auto regulation is very important. Um, so let's say in season. Now we know for a fact, soccer's a bit different because they play Friday, Saturday, Saturday, Sunday. So I'm just gonna give you a stock answer with football. I know for a fact my footy boys play on a Saturday, right? So they'll play a Saturday, right? The first thing I'll do is that the frequency per week is twice per week. They're gonna lift a Monday and a Wednesday. They're gonna train their sport on a Tuesday and a Thursday, right? How I do things, and then they play on a Saturday, right? So a usual week workout like this for my football boys. Monday, so Sunday they do their recovery. I'm big on educating them on the benefits of how important is sleep for neurological recovery, for physiological restoration, carbohydrate and protein, glycogen resynthesis, protein resynthesis, correct? Alex is pointing to the brain. Um, so I'm real big on that. Straight after the game, you want to regenerate. You've got to eat, okay? I'm big on that. Um, also, I'm real big on educating them on contrast therapy, cryotherapy, ice bars, con uh, hot colds, 
compression gear, even though there's not much research to support it. A big thing I'm big on is placebo as well. If they believe it, why not? If it gives perceived, um, perceived le uh, decreased levels of perceived soreness, why the fuck not do it? My rule with my guys, if it ain't gonna harm them, just fucking do it, so just do it. Compression, um, sleep, as I said, a big one before. They're the main ones that we're gonna look at. Uh, f uh, something like um, just general light, low aerobic activity, which we know helps regenerate, helps move out any soreness. It might be like a, um, a pool session where once again, at low intensity, you don't want to up the intensity or we're gonna derive that energy through that anaerobic gly glycolytic pathway. We don't want that. We don't want any lactate in the, in the body or the hydrogen. So um, that's a Sunday. So we'll do some sort, like I'll educate them on doing some sort of recovery. Because they come in Monday, they're not gonna be able to fucking lift it. They're sore. They have to stay on top of this. So you have to educate them on the benefit of it, nutrition, hydration, recovery, restoration. Fucking critical. That's the first thing. Monday they come in, they do their first session. Now I in season, there's an option you can do. I've got to give them my two options: two full body sessions or two lower body, one upper body. Depends. It's up to you what you want to do. I prefer two two full body sessions. Right. Um, keep it simple as possible. Or um, some of my guys at the moment are doing two lower body, one upper body. Once again, up for them doesn't really matter. But probably the rule, I'd probably if they could, if they had the time, I'd do two, uh, two lower body, one upper body. Just because it, it is, for me, I'd rather concentrate on the lower bodies because that's what holds them. And then do an isolation, like do an upper body session by itself. I'd like that because you gotta think if it's a full body session, it is a lot, it's very taxing. But I've done it for a few years and it works quite well. So. Um, let's say two, body, two full body sessions. They come in, the first session a week is what we call maximum effort. When I say maximum effort, I'm talking about heavy, heavy, like I'm big on, um, not big on, but I use the template of uh, Louis Simmons Westside Barbell, which you can, it's applicable for field based sport athlete, not just a string sport athlete. And we use uh, maximum effort, dynamic effort, repeat effort. But I also combine a bit of uh, Westside with um, Mike Boyle stuff, eight areas of programming. I've combined those two plus Maryland, plus VIS where I, where I interned there at Maryland and all other places I've interned at. And then I've, then after I've got all that information, I've seen a puzzle, then I've put my own stuff in that I've liked and I've made Woodford Methods, Woodford. So this is Woodford training sessions with a bit of it, like making the perfect recipe and I put it all in together and I'm always refining my systems. But I've always stick to the fundamentals. Even if you look five years ago, I'm still doing compound, multi-joint, multi ground-based movements, posterior chain focus, mobility. I've still done the same shit I had five years ago with Woodford training systems. They've just been refined. The core of the program always stays the same. What we knew about training 100 years ago, we still know that we still know now. Progressive overload, coach the athlete, um, slow control progression. So I do done it, maximum effort, which is lifting, which is maximal strength. Okay. Um, also, before I even do that, right, the explosive movement on session one, the explosive, because everyone knows I do explosive work first, you always want to train the nervous system to um, express force rapidly. Very critical in season because they do not do enough speed or power work. Because especially with our footballers, there's such an emphasis on uh, conditioning through training and games. Um, that's where they're going to get that aerobic conditioning through. If they want to top up, I give them a top up with GPP. But most of the time, they're gonna get more benefit from neuromuscular. Remember, strength facilitates endurance. Endurance doesn't facilitate strength. We know that for a fact. The minute you start losing muscle tissue, we decrease force training capacity. We're getting slower, we're getting weaker. We need to maintain muscle tissue in season through nutritional interventions. Yeah, you might lose a little bit. I understand that, but you wanna minimize it, okay? Because we, we know for a fact that bigger muscle has a potential to be more powerful, quicker, and stronger muscle. Um, so first power movement in season is um, a power movement and that would be a vertical displacement, a vertical force vector. So like a, a box jump, a, a, a clean. I, I, I don't really do, I do Olympic lifting derivatives. I don't do any front rack with the cleans. I do uh, hand crane pull, hand crane high pull. I like it better, they don't need a front rack. They don't need to. Remember the reason why I use Olympic lift is triple extension ground based power. Vertical displacement to start. Second movement is always that compound core movement. We know bilateral lifts are the core to high threshold fast switch mode in your recruit. We know that's the core because we know when your maximal strength, if your maximal strength, think about maximal strength as a cup. If the maximal strength's not high, the power and the speed's decrease. It's a precursor to power and speed. As the strength goes up, the power and speed goes up to a point. There's a point of diminished returns where strength will no longer be improved, where power will no longer be improved on, and speed by strength. That's where you're gonna be doing higher training velocity specific interventions. Um, so, um, we do that core bilateral movement. 
I do no deadlifting in season. No deadlifting. I get all my hip dominant stuff through my supplementary work. The reason why very neurologically taxing, they do enough work. They got enough to worry. They got enough to worry about them pulling from the floor, or you could rack pull them or loading their back. So I just don't do it. I found it works for me. Hey, you might not like it, but it works for me. I've done it. I haven't had really any injury, soft, no soft, soft tissue injuries in my guys the last five years. So it's worked quite well. No deadlifting in season. All hip dominant stuff through supplementary. So do a squat first off, and it's anywhere. It's a heavy squat. I work anywhere from fucking four, uh, four reps down, and they're doing heavy work in season. Throughout the whole season, they're doing heavy work once a week. Once a week. What I really like about lifting heavy on the Monday, it really moves out any soreness as well, stimulates the nervous system. By Wednesday, they're good to go, like real prime to go. Then after that, might, you might do some uh, upper body work. Sometimes it might be a horizontal push, pull, superset. It might just be a horizontal push. A second session will be a horizontal pull. Remember, what you push, you need to, Alex? Pull. Pull, there we go, one to one ratio. Anterior chain, posterior chain, very important. Um, then after that, they'll do a supplementary quad, do, uh, a supplementary hip dominant. On the first session, I do a supplementary hip dominant bent leg hip extension, which is like a hip thrust or a bridge. The second session will be supplementary, supplementary straight leg hip extension, like an RDL. Okay, or I might do an integrated straight and bent leg hip extension, like a stability of leg curl, stability of leg curl, where you extend up, you hit your glutes, and you curl, but your glutes are always working. They're always the great thing about that is compared to a traditional. Uh, uh, leg curl is with a leg curl. What's the, the traction of a leg curl? There's no there's no action. Yeah, a, a leg curl. What's the what's the what's the issue with a leg curl? It's a posterior chain movement. But what's the issue with a leg curl for an athlete? A machine leg curl. Yes. What's the issue? It's trapped into the machine. It's it's it's. It's an open getting chain movement. I know where you're going with it. But what you were saying was, think about it. Think about jumping. Right. Think about functional activity. Think about the nervous system works. What's it cutting out activity of? Glutes. Very good. So what does the what does the stability ball leg curl do? Right, so you get hip extension at the same time. Boom! How good is that, hey? You hip, hip extension, then you get knee flexion. Oh, fucking perfect. And the whole time the glutes are activated, because you have to hold your hips up to hip, hip extension, so your glutes activate, and you're getting uh, hamstring contraction, knee flexion extension. Bang, really nice move. It might be an integrate, but normally it's a straight leg hip extension. Bent leg is a glute focus, straight leg hamstring focus. Great thing is you're developing the posterior chain. Then you do a core movement. That's it. Now, second session, we do the explosive movement. It's a horizontal displacement. It's always a speed. So the first session is the power work. Power. Remember, power is defined as max amount of force in the shortest possible time. The second movement is always a speed movement, a horizontal displacement. Speed, how you define speed, how quick an athlete can get from point A to point B. The quicker athlete is a better athlete. Um, the second movement, the second session is a dynamic effort session. When I say DEs, Three ways you can actually recruit high threshold fast switch mode units. Number one, heavy load, low repetition. Number two, submaximal load lift explosively. Number three, submaximal load lifted to failure. Okay, the third one's the most inefficient. The first two, strength and power work. So that's, we use DEs um, to express force rapidly. So the second session on the Wednesday is like a DE squat and it might be eight sets of three, 10 sets of two. But the whole idea is it's brief, maximal high intense effort, high intensity mean the speed um, and you're moving the weight quickly. Then the second movement might be, once again, it might be a horizontal pull. If you do a horizontal push for the first time, it might be like a bench pull. Then you do your supplementary uh, stra uh, straight leg extension hip dominant, then another core movement. Remember that how I train the core is um, anti-movement. Uh, anti One of the roles of the core is resist movement, and then that's it. And then se that's session two done. They've done two sessions a week. The first one a strength, the second one a speed session. They've got, they've hit all different parts. See how I've hit all different parts of the curve? High force, high velocity. High force, low velocity, high force, high velocity, high velocity, low force. Surf the curve. I've hit different parts of the curve. I'm, I've developed the entire neuroscope profile during the week. I've got the best athlete. I integrate with the sport. I get athlete performance. I always say this to people. Many roads lead to Rome, many ways to skin a cat. There's many ways we can do this. This is the way I like to do it. It's a combination of science, fundamental sports science principles, and my training methods as well, which worked because I've got real results. And that's what works for me, and I've done that. Obviously, periodization program would change in off-season, pre-season. That's, that's a whole other context that I could talk a while about. But, guys, episode nine. How many questions? Are we starting to build this? We're starting to get a lot of... Yeah, I've got half a dozen more to go. Shit. <laughs> We're nearly to like 25 minutes. Uh, well, I love doing this shit, man. So, it's my passion. So, once again... Go thank you guys for this is this is for you guys. You guys asked for it and I've done it for you. So there we go. I really appreciate your support. Um, thank you for all who came out to Sydney. Guys, any questions for Ask Woodford? Comment.
Hashtag Ask Woodford. I'll try and answer them. Or Alex is the man who chooses them. So if you suck up to Alex, maybe he, he can be the man to choose it. I want to thank all you guys for watching. Thank you for continued support. If you guys want to share this, um, subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. Once again, thank you very much for your support. Thank you for my producer, Alex Sandellis, and for you guys. Let's keep changing the game. I'm Christian Woodford. This is episode nine of Ask Woodford. Thanks very much.